Krylov quantum diagonalization, or KQD for short, refers to solving a matrix eigenvalue problem by projecting the matrix into a subspace prepared on a quantum computer, consistent with the Krylov method, a powerful approach from classical linear algebra. Throughout this video, we'll explore what the Krylov method is, why it's useful, and how and when to implement it on quantum computers. So what is the Krylov method? Suppose we have a matrix H related to a scientific or business endeavor with n rows and n columns. We're interested in the lowest eigenvalue E0 and the corresponding eigenvector psi0. Let's define an initial vector V, which might be motivated by the structure of H or might be entirely random. The Krylov subspace of order R, which we write KR, is generated by acting with h on this initial vector r minus 1 times, adding the result of each subsequent h action to the set of spanning vectors. That is, kr is the space spanned by the vectors v, hv, h squared v, and so on. These vectors will not generally be orthogonal. Classically, we often carry out an orthogonalization process very much like the Gram-Schmidt procedure. You start by normalizing the initial vector v and call the result v0. Then for the next vector, hv, you subtract off its projection onto v0 to make the two vectors orthogonal. You then normalize the result. You continue like this, acting again with h and making the result orthogonal to all previously added vectors, until you've built up r orthonormalized vectors required to span your r-dimensional Krylov subspace. Once you have this subspace, you project your matrix onto it and diagonalize the smaller projected matrix. There are subtleties and extensions, but that is a Krylov method at its simplest level. To get a better sense of how this works, let's look at a trivial example. If H is this matrix and V is chosen to be this vector, then we would start by normalizing V. To generate the second vector in a Krylov subspace, we act once with h on our initial vector and then make that result orthogonal to v0. A little algebra yields this for v1. This is not useful for such small matrices and one would not typically stop at a Krylov dimension of 2. But if we were to project h onto our new Krylov space k2, we would do this using a matrix v which has a Krylov vector for each column and its transpose conjugate which has Krylov vectors for rows. We would then obtain this matrix. This matrix technically has lower dimension than our original. Obviously, this reduction is not useful at this scale. This method is intended for reducing matrices with many thousands or even millions of rows and columns down to just a handful. So why are Krylov methods useful? It turns out that this simple prescription of operator action is often the most efficient way to approach the lowest eigenvalue eigenstate, or ground state, of a matrix operator. Let's make this a bit more explicit, though we'll leave a full proof to the accompanying text. We wish to solve a problem of the form h acting on the vector x gives us some constant times the vector x. Let's start with a guess of our eigenvector x0. This is just an approximate solution it has error, which we call E0. Now we want to make an update of this guess, which we'll call X1, which we hope improves our approximation. We can express this as the original X0 plus some correction P0, which is yet to be determined. We can repeat this process iteratively, adding more and more correction vectors PI. Obviously, we want our error to be reduced, but it isn't just the state that we care about. We also care about the action of h on that state. So the quantity we really want to minimize is the h norm of this error, or the norm of the action of h on this error. Now we can see that this is an expression involving p0, and we can ask ourselves, what choices of p minimize this h norm of the error most efficiently? From what space should we select the correction? Under certain conditions, such as when h is symmetric and positive definite, choosing the first r corrections from within kr turns out to be optimal. 
In simpler terms, we need some way of preparing a good subspace onto which we can project our Hamiltonian. And in many cases, the Krylov subspace is the space spanned by the vectors of most efficient corrections to our initial guess. For a real proof, see the text accompanying this video. Everything we've described so far can be done classically. So how and when would we use a quantum computer? For very large matrices, the Krylov method can require long computing times and large amounts of memory. The time required for matrix operation of H on V scales like n squared in the worst case. And this is done for every vector we want in our subspace. The subspace dimension R is usually not a significant fraction of n and often scales like log of n. So generating all vectors scales like order n squared log n. Although there are other steps, like orthogonalization, this is the dominant scaling to keep in mind. Quantum computing allows us to change what attributes of the problem determine the scaling of the time and resources required. Instead of dependence on matrix size n across the board, we'll see things like the number of shots and the number of non-commuting Pauli terms that make up a Hamiltonian. Let's explore how this works. Recall that the operator that time evolves a quantum state is the exponential of negative i h t over h bar. And it's very common, especially in quantum computing, to drop the h bar from the notation. One way of understanding and even realizing such an exponential function of an operator is to look at its Fourier series expansion. Note that this operation, acting on some initial vector v, yields a sum of terms with increasing powers of h applied to the initial state. It looks like we can just make our Krylov subspace by time evolving our initial guess state. And that's almost true. The caveat is in realizing the time evolution on a real quantum computer. Many of the terms in the Hamiltonian will not commute with each other. So while some simple exponential operators like e to the negative i z correspond to simple circuits, General Hamiltonians do not. And since they contain non-commuting terms, we can't simply decompose the exponential into a product of simple ones the way we can with numbers. So this is not trivial, but this is a well-studied process in quantum computing. We carry out time evolution on quantum computers using a process called trotterization, which in itself is a rich subject, but at a very high level, by breaking the time evolution into small steps, say m steps, we limit the effects of the non-commutativity of terms. Let us call the Krylov subspace of order r that we generated in the classical context, using powers of h directly, the power Krylov subspace, kpr. Now we generate a similar space using the unitary time evolution operator u given by the exponential of negative i h t. We'll refer to this as the unitary Krylov space, KUR. The power Krylov subspace, KPR, that we use classically can't be generated directly on a quantum computer as h is not a unitary operator. Using the unitary Krylov subspace can be shown to give similar convergence guarantees as the power Krylov subspace. Specifically, the ground state error converges efficiently as long as the initial state v has overlap with the true ground state that is not exponentially vanishing, and as long as there's a sufficient gap between eigenstates. Here, powers of u become different time steps. The kth power of u is stepping forward by a time k times dt. We can label the element of the subspace that is time evolved for a total time k dt as psi sub k. We can project our Hamiltonian h onto the unitary Krylov subspace kur. In other words, we calculate each matrix element of h in the kur basis. We'll refer to this projected matrix as h tilde. The matrix elements of h tilde are given by these expectation values, which can be estimated using the quantum computer. Keep in mind that h can be written as a sum of Pauli operators on different qubits, and that not all Pauli operators can be measured simultaneously. We can sort the Pauli terms into groups of commuting terms and measure all of those at once. 
but we may need many such groups to cover all the terms. So the number of distinct commuting groups into which the terms can be partitioned, n GCP, becomes important. If we use a unitary Krylov subspace of dimension r, the resulting matrix will have dimensions r times r. If r is much less than n, then we've made useful progress. And typically, r is much less than 100, meaning we can diagonalize this easily on a classical computer. But recall that psi n and psi m will not generally be orthogonal. It is sometimes possible to diagonalize a matrix in a non-orthogonal basis, but there are numerical and physical reasons for first changing to an orthogonal basis. Hence, we solve a generalized eigenvalue problem using the Gram matrix S. The mn element of the Gram matrix is given by the inner product of psi m on psi n. Both the elements of H tilde and S are calculated using a Hadamard test. The generalized eigenvalue problem then becomes this. As noted above, the dimension of the unitary Krylov subspace R is exponentially smaller than our initial matrix dimension n. So this eigenvalue problem is simple to solve classically. To recap, we start with a reference state, then evolve it for different periods of time to generate the unitary Krylov subspace. We project our Hamiltonian onto that subspace, and we also estimate the overlaps of the subspace vectors. Finally, we solve the lower dimensional generalized eigenvalue problem classically. Let's compare what determines computational costs of using the Krylov technique classically and quantum mechanically. We sketched this already for the classical version, and there are not perfect analogs between classical and quantum approaches for all steps, but this table collects some scaling of different steps for consideration. Recall that Hamiltonians generally have terms that cannot be simultaneously measured because they do not commute. We sort terms in the Hamiltonian into groups of commuting Pauli operators that can all be measured simultaneously, and we may require many such groups to account for all the terms that do not commute. To build up H tilde on a quantum computer requires separate measurements for each group of commuting Pauli strings in the Hamiltonian, and each of those require many shots. We must do this for R squared different matrix elements, corresponding to R squared combinations of different time evolution factors. There are sometimes ways to reduce this, but in this rough treatment, the time required for this scales roughly like the number of shots times the number of groups of commuting Pauli terms times R squared. The elements of S must be estimated, which scales like the number of shots times R squared. Finally, solving the generalized eigenvalue problem in the projected space classically takes time that scales like r cubed. We see that quantum Krylov diagonalization may be useful in cases where the number of commuting Pauli groups in the Hamiltonian is relatively small. This scaling dependency suggests some applications where the Krylov method can be useful and others where it likely will not be. Some Hamiltonians have high complexity when mapped to qubits, involving many non-commuting Pauli strings that cannot easily be partitioned into a few commuting groups. This is often true of quantum chemistry problems, for example. This complexity presents two primary challenges for near-term quantum computers. First, the estimation of each element of H tilde becomes computationally expensive due to the large number of terms. Second, the required Trotter circuits become prohibitively deep. Both of these points will be less problematic when quantum computers reach fault tolerance, but they must be considered in the near term. Even systems with simpler mappings than those in quantum chemistry may experience the same impediments if the Hamiltonians have too many non-commuting terms. The Krylov method is most useful where the Hamiltonian can be partitioned into relatively few commuting Pauli groups and where H is easy to implement in Trotter circuits. Both of these conditions are satisfied, for example, for many lattice models of interest in physics. KQD is especially useful if very little is known about the ground state. This stems from its inherent convergence guarantees and its applicability in scenarios where alternative methods are untenable due to insufficient ground state knowledge. While KQD is a powerful tool, the protocol's time-consuming aspects, particularly the estimation of each element of the projected Hamiltonian and the overlap of Krylov states, represent opportunities for an improvement. An alternative approach involves 
approximating the Krylov state using Trotter circuits, then sampling the approximated state to obtain a projection onto the computational basis, and then projecting H onto the subspace spanned by these computational basis states. In cases where it is applicable, this methodology, known as sampling-based Krylov quantum diagonalization, SKQD, potentially offers significant reductions in time and resource requirements compared to traditional KQD. The integration of Krylov subspace techniques with sampling methods in SKQD represents an exciting frontier in quantum algorithms.